Another ISIS feature that people may be interested in uh, relates to what's called a distributed hash table. So in modern computing systems, uh, it's become very common to pull large amounts of data into the cloud, and we don't necessarily want to replicate all of that data on every node. Now, on the other hand, if we pull a piece of data into the cloud and we only keep it on one node, then if that node crashes, we end up losing our data. Your options are what? You could write the data into your global file system, and at that point the file system becomes a huge bottleneck. Or you can keep the data out in the first tier of the cloud, but as we've discussed in earlier modules, the outer tier of the cloud uses a soft state model, and if a node crashes, the state is lost. So it's become common to build certain kinds of systems using what's called sharding. I've illustrated it here, and the idea is to have two or three replicas of some kind of a piece of data like this spread out with the goal that if the data is, is in memory, in the outer tier, replicated to this degree, the odds of losing it are pretty low, and then we can use this sharded representation as a high-performance cache. It could be the actual representation of data that's used for services of various kinds, or it could be that there's some underlying system where the actions really exist and where the data is, and this could just be some sort of snapshot into it. So either way, what we think about here are key value stores, the idea being that each item has a name, it's key, and that the keys are used to decide which shard to put the item into, and then if I ask you to save a piece of data, if I ask the system to save a piece of data, we want to replicate it onto the corresponding shard. We take the key, map it to the shard, and then replicate it within the shard. Well, you can see that this pattern of replication sounds a lot like what ISIS was built for. One of the complications with ISIS, though, is that, as you may remember, you're not really supposed to be a member of hundreds and hundreds of groups. So what we did in ISIS is we created a way to take a single group and turn it into a collection of shards so that with a single group you can host as many shards as you like as subgroups within it. And then we modified the various ISIS primitives so that they could understand how to talk to groups that had been sharded in this way using key value data. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about in this module. So you should understand that shards always have two or three members. You could build shards that are much, much bigger, and ISIS won't care, but the way you think about these systems usually would be more consistent that they be a couple of members. Uh, it's assumed that it's regular, but that they don't have to be strictly regular. So what will really happen in ISIS is you might say that I'd like my group to have shards of size 3, and it may turn out that there's the occasional shard that's of size 2 or 4 because we don't have quite enough members, <clears throat> or we could have actually a member or two left over and we just keep sticking them in. I'll show you the rule that's used. So it's a target, uh, and in fact, in general, a sharded group has a target size, a target number of shards, and from the combination, we're basically expressing a target on how many shard members each shard should have. And then as ISIS climbs out across the group, it says, oh, I've got these extra members. What do I do with them? It sticks them in some of the shards, and you end up with shards that are a bit too big. So you can mix and match, and you can fully replicate some data, and you can shard other data. And it gives you really quite a lot of power to start to think about the things you can do with these features. So a shard, in general, is a container for some data items. The data items are understood to be have a key and a value, which could be any kind of an object you like. Uh, I'll tell you what we need, but basically if we have a hash function on that object type, we're going to be able to treat it as a key. And the value can be any kind of a structure or an existing object or, or, or a pre-existing type that you would like. You can store things in as long as you can explain to ISIS how to serialize that. And that, of course, you would do by uh, using the, uh, the marshaller that's built into ISIS, or you could use C-sharp marshaling. And then what we're going to do is help you spread this distributed hash table out across large numbers of nodes. So you're going to form a big group that might have, say, 100 or 1,000 members. And our job is going to be to subdivide them into shards. And then when you say put something in, put the data in the right place. When you say get it, get it from the right place. And we have some slightly fancier features I'll tell you about, too. We're trying to make ISIS uh, strongly consistent, right? So we're trying to make ISIS powerful in ways that existing distributed hash tables, like um, the, the very popular memcached uh, 
um, uh, aren't. And one way we do that is we're going to offer some very strong consistency, security, and, co and coordination, fault tolerance properties that are intrinsic to ISIS. And if you understand how ISIS works by now, you're going to see that these are very, very natural ideas in ISIS. Um, but you wouldn't find anything like it if you looked at a typical memcached implementation or something like the CORD or Pastry DHT from places like MIT, University um, uh, of Cambridge, uh, Rice, and Microsoft did Pastry. So where do the keys and values come from? You're going to provide those. You've got information and you have a notion of a key and a value. Very often a key might be something like a, a file name or a web page name, something like that. Um, and the value could be the data, the bytes that are in that page. Um, it's not a good idea to try to put really large objects into this though. So if you really were doing huge web pages or something, I would recommend put the web page somewhere else in a file, maybe a memory map file, and have the keys and values be things like the file name and some attribute information that you can do quick lookups on. The ISIS DHT is not really built to have very big objects directly in the DHT. The DHT can talk about big objects, and there could be a way to get to them that's very fast. Like if they're memory mapped, once you have the file name, you can just go and get them if you're in the right place. But it's unwise to try to put huge things into this structure. It just wasn't built for it, and your performance will be terrible. OK? Uh, and we're going to use the term subset multicast. So we've, we've all learned about multicast by now. But multicast, in the way that I've described it up to now in the other modules, always reaches the whole group. With sharded groups like these, we can talk about multicasts to an individual shard or to a set of shards. And that's what a subset multicast does. Its target would be one or more shards or some subset of the group members. And then I'm going to show you uh, something that we call aggregation. And this arises when you do shard data, you sometimes get in situations where you have to query a big group, but you're going to get so many responses that you're worried that the sender will get overwhelmed with all those replies coming in. And aggregation lets you combine the data into a smaller representation so that in the network, we reduce the size of those replies. And by the time the data comes out, we've got something small and convenient to work with. So here's how you set this thing up, and I do apologize for the infinitesimally tiny type font on, on this. You can see you're going to call DHT enable, and what you're going to give it are the replication factor desired for your shards, um, which would be something like two or three in the examples I've given you, and the expected group size, which might be 150, and so that would tell you right away that we're going to get 50 shards roughly. And then the minimum group size is specified so that we don't get in a situation where our system tries to go live when some of the shards don't have any members at all. So a minimum group size might be 50 or 100, the idea being that we can operate the DHT while we're above the minimum group size. And if we slip below it for a period of time, it doesn't crash, but it won't allow people to do new DHT operations because it's afraid of encountering what we call a depopulated shard. And there's a, a version of this, an overload, where you can specify how long the things you put into the DHT should be retained. You specify what we call a time to live, a TTL value in milliseconds. And if that amount of time expires, we automatically clear the item out of the DHT, which sort of garbage collects in an automated way. You could also garbage collect by getting rid of the entire group. If you just call g.terminate, the group will go away, and all the data that was in it will go away. The number of shards will always be the expected group size divided by the uh, target replication factor. So here we got a nice example of this. We've got some DHT uh, puts, which are tuples, key and value. And you can see what's happening here is that we're taking the key for can. We, we generate a hash code from it. We take that modulo, the number of shards, that took us to the yellow shard, and we put ken, 58 into there, um, along with others. So in general, what a shard has in it is a long list of key value pairs. Um, a DHT put for Sarah of 26 went to a different shard, the pink one. Um, and if somebody does a DHT get of ken, take the key, you map it down to the yellow group, and you can ask any of the members of the group, and the system automatically load balances and picks randomly among them and talks to one of those members, and it does a point-to-point -point RPC uh, using the ISIS internal mechanism. For doing that, and you get back, in this case, 58. So you can see that the idea is really trivial. It really comes down to a put and a get operation. 
Um, what we do with ISIS uh, is we've created a thing that we're calling IDA, the infrastructure for uh, data analysis, because data analytics would very often run on these kinds of DHTs. And what it is, is it's built on ISIS, uh, but it introduces multi-tuple operations where you can actually put a bunch of tuples in at once, you can do a bunch of gets at once, and we've studied this, there's a paper I've written on it which I'm not going to recite to you here, but it shows that you can do really pretty sophisticated computations once you've got um, can strongly consistent ordered ways to do that and we're able actually to do an ordered multi-tuple put and an ordered multi-tuple get and ordered multi-tuple queries which means that we're able to do strongly consistent operations. In a current piece of work which hasn't been released yet but should be later in 2014 we're actually integrating this with Hadoop MapReduce uh, kinds of functionality on the HDFS and in that version the data that's of interest is in HDFS in files we have commands that let you update those files. The file names are the keys and the file contents are the values. ISIS is integrated in, in this work that we're currently doing into Hadoop and HDFS and the effect of all of this is that the MapReduce user is able to get dynamicism for MapReduce data in a way where MapReduce itself doesn't seem to have changed at all. MapReduce only runs when it's, there's a locking mechanism used, and MapReduce only runs when the files are sta static. And in between the MapReduce jobs, we can slide in there and do updates, which gives you dynamically updatable MapReduce data, which is quite a nice, nice feature. For the moment, you can only get to that same functionality through the programmatic interfaces in the library. But if you're after that kind of Hadoop functionality, wait a little bit later in 2014, and we'll be giving it to you in a release from our group. So now I want to say a few words about what makes a DHT a DHT because frankly if you try to build something on the ISIS DHT that departs from this principle, first of all it won't act like a DHT and it might even break. So DHT-ness centers on the idea that although your data is spread widely you get lightning fast responses and fundamentally what that seems to mean for most people is that whether it's a request that does a put or a get the cost is one network latency to each member. So a put has to talk to a couple of members because you have to update the whole shard, but you're expecting to see one request out, some acknowledgments done. And if it's a get, you talk directly to the right node, get a response directly back. There have been DHTs proposed, Cord and Pastry are good examples of them, that take logarithmic hops to find something, so you want to look something up and you have to jump around, but even five or eight hops, which is a typical value of log in, um, it's, it's just too slow. So this ISIS DHT, where you go directly to the right answer node and get an answer directly back, which is just based on the fact that in ISIS we have a group view, and so we know who's in the group, we know who the yellow members are, it turns out to give us one hop access. You can talk right to the right node, get an answer back. And that's definitely DHT behavior that you would associate with, with Memcached or other popular cloud DHTs, whereas Cord and Pastry have not been successful on the cloud because they're considered to have too much overhead with all this jumping around. Now, in order to make that work, we wanted to get our sharding to work on the process group views, so I thought I should explain how we're doing that because actually once you understand how it works, you can easily take full control of it. So what we do is the obvious. We're going to take uh, either a, a key or a node identifier, and we want to map that to a shard number. And the question is how we do this. Now, I showed you how we did it in a picture. Ken mapped to yellow, Sarah mapped to pink. Um, and I've been showing you pictures in which we go from left to right. First three pink nodes, then three yellow nodes. That's not really what we do. What we actually do in ISIS is we hash, we use the hash code method, so get hash code, uh, the, the node identifier in order to figure out which uh, shard it's in, and we, we hash the key to figure out which shard it is. And so let me show you how we do that. So here is the picture we showed you previously on top with three members of the blue shard, three of the yellow shard, three of the orange. On the bottom is what we really do. And you can see what's happened is we still have three members, well four I think actually in some of these, but now we're counting off blue, yellow, orange, green, red, blue, yellow, orange, and we're doing that in the process group view. 
So the first thing we're going to do then is the rank of a process in the process review modulo the number of shards is going to tell us which shard that member is in. All right. If that was hard to understand, it's just the picture I've shown you on the bottom. Okay. So uh, if your rank is zero, you're in shard zero. But if there are five shards, you can see that once we got to four, which was red, the fifth note, so it's modulo five, right, would be back to, to, to shard zero. And that's how we're getting blue, blue, blue. Okay. You see how that's working? So we calculated how many shards there would be from those target values you gave us. That's the modulus. The rank in the group tells us which shard the process is in. And now we're going to do the same sort of thing with keys. So with a key, if you give us a key, we're going to compute the hash code, take that hash code modulus, the number of shards, and now we're going to know which shard to put that key into. All right. Now, one thing you could worry about this is a problem that people call churn, which is this. What happens if like the second member of this entire group, the guy with rank two, were to crash? If you glance at this picture, you can see, well, at a glance, it would look like three becomes two, four becomes three. So it would sound like we have to shift the roles. But think about what that would mean if I put lots and lots of data into my shard. Even if the keys and values are small, I could have a lot of them. So I could have hundreds of millions of keys and values that I'm supposed to shift if I did that. And we don't want that. So we had an idea. What we do instead is we take whoever is the last member in the group and if a failure occurs, we remap the last member into the slot. And if two failures occurred, we remap the last two members. If we get lucky, which is going to happen in this case, we don't have to transfer any data to that guy at all. He was in shard four, he's still in shard four. More often, we wouldn't get lucky. In this example, four times out of five, we probably wouldn't have gotten lucky. But then we only have to transfer data to, from one member of, the, of, say, the red shard to the new guy who plays the red role. So we have a very small number of key value tuples that have to be transferred. And that's done using the ISIS state transfer mechanisms built into ISIS, uh, just as you use them, I use them. And I've got the code to transfer the correct data to the correct places uh, built down into the DHT. So it helps a lot to have extra members in a DHT because otherwise your shards might drop below their target size. And this is why I was saying earlier that if you're hoping to have shards of size three and you would like to have five of them, instead of having 15 members in the group, tell us that you're aiming for a 15 member group and that maybe you don't want us to be active below size 10, but then put 18 members in the group or 20. And those spares will be available to be remapped. We'll use them as shard members anyway in the meantime, but in the event of a failure, we'll remap them and we won't ever drop below your threshold size and we get this benefit of very, very fast reconfiguration after a failure with no churn. Now, in effect, because I'm using get hash code to, to map keys to shards, you can control which keys go to which shards. You might want to ignore this, and many people do. They just want some random spread, and then they just use nice random looking hash codes. But I've seen applications which do things like trying to cluster data. The way to cluster data would be to make sure that items which need to be at the same place simply map to the same shard. And you can do that by using a get hash code method which encodes whatever logic is required. And furthermore, you can change the behavior of the get cache code method. The only rule is only change it at moments when a new view event is delivered to your application. It's at those moments that ISIS allows you to redefine the behavior of get hash code. And then ISIS will look at your new definition of get hash code and it will shuffle the pattern of mapping accordingly. You'll say, oh, this item shouldn't be on the red shard, it should be on the yellow shard, and it'll shift it over and do this in a highly parallel, very efficient way. So this is really quite a powerful feature. It doesn't exist in any distributed hash system that I'm aware of, uh, and it allows you to do a kind of a fast, efficient shuffle uh, in ISIS. And furthermore, because you can have control over this mapping, um, if you have sort of styles of computation where I need to look at items that have, I don't know, the same last name, you know, if it's, if it's names of some kind, you could cluster them by making sure that people with the same last name hash to the same shard number. You see? So this is something quite powerful if you want to take advantage of it. 
Here I've got some examples of user-defined hashing. Um, the, the big example that's famous turns out to be that people who are doing page rank, which is the way that Google and similar systems cluster web pages, um, they actually run an algorithm where co-locating pages that point to each other is important. And there's been a lot of interesting research on how exactly to do that. You could take those algorithms, which were developed by, Carl, by um, um, uh, Carlos uh, Gestrin at University of Washington. He was at Yale at the time he did the work. And you could easily encode them as get hash code methods, which co-locate pages if they have a similarity of, of pointers. And then that gives you efficiency, it turns out, in the, in the way that the map reduce uh, um, computation calculates page rank. And that would be an example. It's a pretty complicated example, but you know, let's face it, if we're doing cloud computing and we're working with applications on a massive scale, we can't always avoid the complexity. Here's a numerical key. If keys are just integers, you can just return the shard number you want me to use because the way that I'm calculating the shard number is to, is to take what you gave me from get hash code modulo the number of shards. So if you give me back a number between zero and the number of shards minus one, I will put the item exactly where you told me to put it. That's very efficient. So what can the hash function do? Any calculation based on the given key, anything based on the group view, anything based on um, other attributes of the object being stored. So really you have quite, quite a lot of flexibility. And as I mentioned, if you like, you can even redefine the way the hash code operates as long as all the group members use the identical hashing rule. All right, so, so two different members of the group had better hash the same key to the same place. And as long as changes to the hash code method are done only the, to its behavior occur only at members places where group view changes are occurring. Along those cuts, ISIS is idle, and then after, it's built into ISIS to reshuffle the tuples as needed. Now, what happens with collisions? In many DHTs, if you put an item in with the same key as something that's already present, you automatically override the old value with the new one. And in fact, we do do that in ISIS. We have a kind of a timestamp at the time you put things in, and the real rule is that it, by default, if you put something with the same key and a different value, we will retain the one that has the more current timestamp. So even if there was a real-time collision, we'll end up with consistent data in our DHT. But we'll call this a collision, and in these collisions, you can actually get an up call to your code and combine the, the, value, the old value that was there with the new incoming value any way you like. And so I'm going to quickly show you how to do that. And I'll comment that a second form of collision occurs um, when distinct items map to the same key. But that form of collision doesn't worry us because the shard keeps a list of items that mapped into it. And so there could be lots and lots of items that map to a given shard. Right? So the kind of collision that's worrying would, or that where we want to have control is what do we do if the identical key is used? Of course, we'll get to the same shard. But now the question is, which version do we keep? So the deal is, keep the fresher one unless you tell me to do something differently. And then you can define a method, if you'd like to, um, that it's called the DHT put collision resolver. And its job is that when a, a collision occurs, if you prefer some other functionality, you define this method that takes a key and two values. And its job is simply to return the value you want me to retain, which could be value one, value two, like I already do. In fact, the default resolver just looks at the timestamps, keeps the one that's uh, more recent. Um, but you can combine them in any way you like. And in fact, you could create some kind of a, of a list of values and keep appending to the list. We don't even really require that the resolver return something of the same type as the arguments it receives. So you really have a lot of flexibility here. You could take two integers and return a list of integers. You could take integers and return their average. You could compute the bigger of the two, the smaller of the two, any of these kinds of things. Keep track of the five largest values associated with this key. Any of those kinds of functionalities are trivial to express with this kind of a resolver. And all that's required is that every member of the group implements the resolver. Now, what about multi-key operations? 
DHT put and DHT get in ISIS allow you to talk about one key and one value, but you can also provide lists of keys and values. And they don't have to be on the same shards. And the deal is going to be, we're going to do an ordered multicast in such a way that we don't burden members who shouldn't even hear about the multicast. So that's a novel thing about ISIS. It only talks to the right subset of nodes, but it does guarantee that they apply the actions in a same totally ordered way, just like if ordered send was used. And so these methods don't have the identical name because they have a cost and you might not want that. But if you want that behavior, you use DHT ordered put and DHT ordered get. And in those cases, we run down this list, we figure out which shards we're talking to. For the ordered put, we figure out what the members of those shards are and we talk to that group and we get an ordered send across that set of members, the subset of the group. And if it's a get, for each of those shards, we select one member at random and we talk to that set and we pull back the values again along an ordered cut. This is really quite a powerful functionality. So you're going to be giving us a list and how do you give us a list of key value pairs? In C Sharp, the notion of a key value pair is a built-in type and so you end up with a list and the elements of the list are key value pairs and the keys have a key type that you specified and the values have a value type that you specified strings, integer, or it could be any kind of an object you would like to define in your application. So here's a few examples. Uh, this piece of code starts with a, uh, a list of key value pairs and puts into the list a whole series of things. They have the form integer string. That happens to be what it uses. And then when it's all done, it calls DHT put once and the whole group of, in this particular case, it'll be, gosh, looking at this, I can't tell you how many n tuples, I think, whatever the n tuples divided by four. But in any case, whatever this is, this this does, it'll put that whole bunch of things in at once. And then here, the second example down below, the for loop extracts back. Uh, oh no, this is also a, a multi a multi put. Uh, I had a multi get uh, on the next thing. I think the difference I was trying to express here is that the top one is unordered, and so those puts could overlap with gets, and the bottom one is a g.dht ordered put, where any two ordered puts will come in at the same order. And that's not that important, but the ordered puts ordered gets guarantee that the gets will see the system when no puts are occurring. So it's kind of like an atomic transaction against the DHT. You don't find that in other DHTs, but it really seems to be quite a powerful functionality if you're trying to get consistent answers back, because if you're data involves updating several things, you wouldn't really want to see the DHT where some of those updates have been done and other responses didn't include it. Uh, and here's, a, here's an ordered multi-get. Um, and you can see it comes back with a, it's sending in a list of keys. So that's why this code is kind of messy. So you can see the first key is an int computed to be start plus count plus my rank plus times 10. The second key is another integer computed from another formula. And then there's a third key. And those three integers are sent in. And in one atomic operation, we're going to query the correct shards and they're going to give us back the values that they've got associated with those keys. And we got back this result. And the result is a list. And so in this particular case, I'm telling how many elements are in the list, but I could also iterate down that list and they would be a list of key value pairs. And you can ask yourself a question. What would have happened in this example if I had used DHT get instead of DHT ordered get? All right. And I'm hoping that you're realizing that the answer is, well, then I might sometimes kind of intersect with a put, even an ordered put, because DHT get just, just reaches out real fast. So I get a faster protocol, but it might intersect with a put, and I might see some updates done and some others not done. Whereas with ordered get, I'm guaranteed that if sets of things are being put in, I always only see the DHT at moments when a put isn't occurring, you see? So ordered put and ordered get go together, and otherwise you might use put and get. But with put and get, you can get those kind of crossing events. So this is a good way to visualize what I just said. With ordered put and ordered get, operations occur along these kind of curvy lines, call them consistent cuts, but they never cross each other. And so you would never be in a situation where some of the respondents don't know about an update and others have already applied the update. That would involve the update and the get 
crossing. You see? Whereas if I had used DHT put and DHT get as opposed to the ordered versions, then you could see crossing of these, of these cuts. And that might mean you could get inconsistent answers. Okay, and so this just summarizes that the wavy lines represent puts and gets, they never cross, and this is just like database transactional serializability, but here we're getting it on a DHT on an operation by operation basis. We don't have true database transactions where you can say begin and do a series of operations and then end. Really what's happening here is that the begin and the end are hidden from you, and DHT ordered get and put, the begin end comes in the sense that I can access many things at one time or I can put many things in at one time. Now, you can also do things that are kind of fancy. For example, a multicast to the DHT could be used to trigger puts by its members. So how might that look? Well, you'd send in a multicast and then the members that get it would introduce new shards. They would probably do it redundantly because your multicast will probably reach multiple members and then each one of them will do puts, and those might be the same puts. But that gives you fault tolerance as well. This, I think, is a pretty fancy functionality. I'm not expecting that many people would use it, but I want you to understand the kinds of things a DHT like this can support. Um, you do have to think about robustness to failures if you use features like this. And I wouldn't be surprised if you send me an email at this point if you're thinking of using that feature, and I'll be happy to help you out with it. Uh, what about queries and multicasts? Uh, well, what we can do here is the same feature that's used to do DHT ordered put and DHT ordered get, actually, you can also do an ordered query that invokes those features. And in that way, you can talk to a set of shards and not have to overload the entire DHT with a query that really is only relevant to the red and the green shard. So here's how that works. You do an ordered send and I'm going to show you how in a second, you specify which shards you want it to talk to or which keys it's relevant to. It goes to that corresponding shards and the ordered send will automatically go, if you use the key feature especially, it'll just go to one representative of each of those shards. So for example here, I'm going to one representative of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, but I don't have to get the full set. I could pick the subset I want based, for example, on the keys I'm concerned with. And then they can reply to me. And in that way, I can query my DHT. Now, that does mean you need a way to get to the DHT. And I'll explain how you do that to get to the data that's on the node you're on. But it's really easy to do. And uh, it's quite powerful. And the other possibility um, is uh, you, could, you could talk to the DHT, not in terms of which members, but which keys you're concerned with. And in that case, we'll collapse it down. We do something uh, called the DHT key. Now, now before I get to that, let me just answer this first piece. Um, so how do you get to the DHT if you're in the DHT and you've got a query? So we've got an API built into the ISIS DHT called DHT, and it takes a key type and a value type as its arguments. And what it does is it looks at the key value list at that member, at each member, because you're going to call this in parallel at all the places the query occurs. And each one of them comes back with a, a copy, basically, of the DHT contents, which match the key type and value type you specified. You can specify object to object if you want everything. And otherwise, you could say string int, and I'll give you back all the string int key value pairs. You see? Now, that turns out to be very nicely integrated with something called language embedded um, queries in, in C Sharp and .NET. If you don't know what this is, don't worry about this part of the, of the video, but Link is a kind of a database technology that Microsoft has integrated closely with languages like C Sharp, and it allows you to do queries right in line, and Link is designed to work on key value pairs. So you can do things like the piece of code I've written here, where I go to the DHT and ask it to come back with the key value pairs that have an int type for the key and an int type for the value. I get back a list of key value pairs. And then in this case, I group them so that I end up with a, a new, smaller list grouped so that uh, everybody with the same key, this particular group by, um, groups them by creating new key value pairs in which the keys 
are computed from the old values divided by a thousand. All right. So there are different kinds of things you can do here. And <clears throat> these kinds of, of database style queries on the, the key value set really let you think about the DHT as a database that's been spread over your group. All right. It's, it's amazingly powerful. Of course, we're talking about pretty advanced C-sharp programming by now, but uh, people who are proficient with this would be, uh, I would say, first of all, working exactly at the level of the typical employees at Google and Microsoft these days. And secondly, able to write these incredibly concise pieces of code, which can do astonishingly complex things on a dynamically changing distributed hash table at very large scale in a cloud computing data center. And so this is really bringing a type of power to the cloud that doesn't exist in any other form, and with strong consistency, security, and fault tolerance, which I think is quite a killing combination. So who calls this? Well, you'd have to send your query to the right nodes, and then those nodes will each have to call DHT, uh, and then they can take what, these lists that came back, process them, and then finally they can reply to the sender. Okay. Now, here's an example of an ISIS uh, request handler, and I only give it to you in order to show you how concise this code can be. So in this particular handler, which is for requests of, I don't know, code zero, you can see we print a message. Then there's one line that does the action, which in this case um, computes some kind of a new list, and it's uh, a slice of the DHT where the key type is int and the, and the value type is string. Uh, it has a select uh, feature where the key modulo 77 is equal to some argument n and among those it selects the values and returns uh, a list of values which this code probably should have had a reply to send it back to the caller okay and it used link as I said now the question of how the caller combines results is worth talking about for a second this is a task we call aggregation and there are kind of two ways to do it um, in C Sharp, it would be very common to have the query caller, who gets back a list of key value pairs in any case, combine them using a link query. So that would be one way to do it. You could, for example, collect a bunch of lists and form one bigger linked list. You could take maximums, averages, combine the data, you know, look for unusual outliers, anything like that. But you could worry, and it would be reasonable to worry, frankly, that if I had a large group, maybe a group that had hundreds of members, that in this kind of a situation, the caller will start to experience packet loss because it's going to get hundreds of incoming replies. And so we've introduced a feature in ISIS which allows you to do something that we call in-network data aggregation. And the idea is to start to move some of that aggregation work that the caller would have done right out into the network. And so it's illustrated here by the yellow stars in this version of the picture. You can see how I formed a tree, and instead of the replies going straight to the caller, the replies move up a tree in pairwise fashion, and each time two of them come together, you see one of those stars, that represents an up call from ISIS into your data aggregator, which is supposed to combine the partial results and then drop the resulting result down to the next level. And the same nodes which are being queried are the ones participating in being the tree, and the initiator of the query, in this case it's node zero, ends up with the result, you see? And so in this way you can do the aggregation in a distributed parallel way. The results flow up the tree and you get an answer out of it. And you never overwhelmed anybody with more than two values coming in to any one node at any given point in time. And so you don't end up with packet loss, which would have been a problem if you had hundreds of incoming values or very big incoming values at any one place. Let me tell you, though, that, that ISIS does pretty well with even queries that get 20 or 30 replies. So you might use aggregation if you had 100 or 1,000 replies coming to one sender. I'm not sure you would ever use it for five, which was the case I just showed you here. So you have to define a method, the aggregator, that takes a key and a value uh, and a second value and returns a result. I'm not going to show you the code for this because it takes lines and lines because of the generics. But it's exactly as simple as the kind of notation here suggests. You have to tell me the types of the key and the value and the value and the result. And that's why it's a little complicated to write it down.
But then you just write code that takes the key and the two values, combines them in whichever way you like, and returns the answer. And the system will call it where those stars were shown in the tree. Um, and the leaf level will be where you call your DHT. Um, also, I do have an example here, as a matter of fact. So here's a, a registered aggregator. This one has a key type event and a value type called a my data object. Um, and you can see that it has, a, has to declare that it has an aggregator, and that's going to get the key and the two values. And in this case, it returns math.max, turns it into a new my data object, and returns it. By the way, if you do do this, you have to make sure ISIS understands what a my data object is by registering the my data type with ISIS, as we discussed when we did the module on basics. That's because ISIS is going to be passing these my data objects around, and it needs to know how to marshal them into a message and demarshal them back into a my data object. <clears throat> so the caller, what does he do? Well, he sends a multicast request uh, to whichever handler he's talking about zero in this example. So that's shown here with the g.send, or it could have been an ordered send. Um, and he needs to identify the particular query we're doing because we're going to be allowing you to do many of these concurrently. So the counter here is some kind of an identifier which is going to let us match up the aggregations occurring with the original caller. It's hidden from you and you don't really see that value in most of your code, but in fact it's used by us to pair things up. You see, we know which query caused this thing to be running. All right, and then here what we did, it was a try-catch, and the reason for that is that if the aggregation tree breaks down because a failure disrupted it, what are we supposed to do? We, we want to give you an answer that reflects exactly one contribution from each shard that's supposed to participate in the query. So in the event of an exception occurring where a failure occurs, what we do is we throw an exception up in the original caller who can catch it. It's called an aggregation failed exception and would very often react by just reissuing the query and hopefully it'll, now it'll compute without a crash occurring during that. Um, the consistency requirement and, and, and guarantee of ISIS then is that first of all if you use the ordered versions of send that you'll never see a put, an ordered put, occurring while your query is executing and secondly that your response reflects exactly one contribution from each participating member. Uh, so, what's the identity that you should use, the ID that you should use for aggregation? You can have multiple identifiers present in the system at one time, or you can actually reuse an ID. If you reuse an ID, you, actually, you can in fact get a kind of a continuous aggregation running, where data is constantly flowing back to the caller. This is a kind of a cool feature, and uh, I'm not going to say more about it right now on this video, but I would recommend reading about it in the ISIS manual if that intrigues you. So one possibility is that you use the same value, maybe zero, again and again and again. And what ISIS will do is it'll keep computing aggregates as quickly as it's able to get new inputs. And the other version, each new query has its own unique identifier and will just match up the contributions of each participant for that identifier and we form a tree and we return it out. The identifier is passed into your query and when you tell us what your leaf level contribution is, you tell us what the corresponding value of this identifier was. Okay, and this is just a, a side remark summarizing what I just said, that you can continuously aggregate using the same key and you get this effect of a flow that's constantly happening. Quite an interesting idea if you think about it for a system which is doing real-time watching of something out there. So suppose that I set up an aggregator for a car that's driving around and its job is to constantly watch for things that car should be aware of. And what you would get out would be a stream of answers based on what all of these different group members kept seeing as threats for that particular car. And then maybe the ID would be an ID representing the car. Right? And each different car would have a different ID. But for that car, you would constantly aggregate again and again. And then the car would just read off these values and say, nothing to worry about now. Oops, there's a little girl playing with a ball over there on the right. Keep one eye on her. You see? Um, you can actually support full database transactions on top of this distributed uh, hash table. I'm not going to explain the details. Um, but I will just point out that the idea is the following. Take any transaction and imagine that you execute it first 
on read-only data, what that transaction will have done is it'll read some values and it will want to do some updates. So take that arbitrary transaction and imagine that you ran it as a query on the ISIS DHT across a consistent cut. Then you could turn around and you could say, perform the updates with a DHT put that works as follows. It says, check that the values, are, the versions of things haven't changed since I ran my original query. And if so, apply those updates. This is an idea that was written up by uh, Marco Singulera in a paper on a system called Symphonia. He called them mini transactions. And they map quite nicely onto the distributed hash table that I've been telling you about. The reason I'm not going to get more detailed about how to do it is that by the time you turn the ISIS distributed hash table into a full distributed database, that's departed quite a bit from DHTness. And if you remember at the very outset, my comment was, what I want to do is retain DHTness without, uh, but, but have as much power as I can without losing consistency. Up to now, I'd argue we've done that, although you probably could question whether the aggregation trees really do retain DHTness. And if you don't think they do, don't use the trees. Respond directly to the caller. Now it's a DHT again in that DHTness definition. This, though, is quite complicated. Here you end up with something that involves something like two rounds of two-phase commit. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting capability, and I actually would like to play with it at some point as a researcher. But essentially, it's a new implementation of a distributed database for the cloud, and you'd want to compare it against other distributed databases for the cloud. That's not something we've done yet, and I don't know how optimized it would be at first glance. If somebody wants to work on this, get in touch with me. I'd be more than happy to work with you to try to make it work. Let me give you an idea of performance right now, but I'm going to comment that these graphs suffer from a problem. We did them on a cluster at Livermore Labs um, that has a, a, an InfiniBand interconnect, and it turns out that we were using ISIS over UDP mapped to InfiniBand at the time. Un, un, uh, unexpectedly, for me at least, InfiniBand is actually kind of slow when you pretend that the InfiniBand connector is a UDP network. So we got numbers which uh, max out much, much earlier than they should in terms of raw performance. Since I generated these graphs, I've been working with some of my graduate students here at Cornell to modify the implementation of ISIS and make it run much faster over InfiniBand using what's called InfiniBand verbs. These same graphs would, would look quite a bit more impressive, probably a factor of 10 faster on the newer system, and we'll rerun them, and then I'll probably re-record this piece of the MOOC. But what you can see here is that as our group size is scaling up, we're getting essentially a linear improvement in the number of operations per second we can perform on the DHT. And that's exactly what you would kind of hope for. Make the DHT bigger, it's got a bigger capacity. Okay, in terms of ordered uh, gets or puts, or this is just for, for, single, for simple gets and puts. And in the second graph down below, what you're seeing very specifically is that as our group gets bigger, what limits us is the speed of the network for doing distributed ordered uh, puts and gets. Um, you could say to yourself, well, yeah, but it could be the speed of ISIS. It could be the performance of ISIS that's maxing out. But I'm going to show you in a moment a different graph where we can see that ISIS doesn't peg the CPUs anywhere near their peak capacity. And so this has us feeling that the bottleneck bandwidth limit is actually the InfiniBand implementation of UDP. So when we take that bottleneck away, we'll still max out. Then we'll see this thing speed up by another factor of 10 or so. At that point, we will peg the CPUs at their maximum pace, and we'll find out what the true performance limit of this DHT would really be at that point. We should be there by July of 2014. Uh, so this, this graph here is something kind of different. It's showing the delay to get answers in different cases. Um, it's using ordered queries or normal queries. Ordered queries are kind of a mustard yellow, and the non-ordered queries are blue. And then it has green is aggregation queries and ordered aggregation queries. And you can see that we get low, lower latencies as a function of group sizes 
uh, for all cases with one exception being ordered query with normal results. And so what that higher latency is showing us is that even for relatively small group sizes, this particular test was able to trigger packet loss at the origin, causing a retransmission, which would inflate the latency delay before we got responses. And so it's showing you that uh, in some cases, uh, just for normal queries, we did perfectly well, but that it was possible with the ordered query uh, protocol, which involves several messages being passed in for back and forth, to overwhelm the receiver who's doing the query. He gets packet loss and he slows down. Aggregation got rid of that problem. Um, and, and the ordered aggregation is the red bar and it has good latencies. And without uh, ordering, we had we had the performance you see here at the bottom which is lower latency low is good in this kind of a graph and so this is illustrating the idea that one of the performance limiting factors is the amount of message traffic at the node issuing the queries ordered query turns out to be a two-phase protocol so it's using roughly three times as many messages to do the same work and you're seeing here somebody who with three times as many messages starts to lose packets with one-third that number hasn't started to lose them yet. Although I bet that the reason the latency is tailing up towards the end is actually because of packet loss. And I believe that what we would see here is that aggregated queries asymptotically would turn out to win, but probably for much bigger groups. Um, I'll comment that this group size of, of, of 1,024 on InfiniBand is really pushing the hardware-software limits for the version of ISIS we tested. And optimization could probably improve the performance of this thing quite a bit. So you may see better numbers from us soon. They're already pretty good. If you really stare at what these numbers are, they're not bad. But we believe that they can be pushed quite a bit higher. And we also believe that the group sizes can be pushed out to 10 or 15,000 group members. Um, 1,000 members in a group was about as many as we could support back in 2013 in the summer when we did that graph. This is where uh, we can see that we were not overloading our members. So the upper graph here on the right is showing the CPU loads on the DHT when we sent in those queries. And what you can see, first of all, is that the only loaded members were the ones in shards that these queries happened to hit. The particular queries didn't touch every shard evenly. They touched a subset. And so only those shards had work. The work, though, was load balanced pretty evenly. We can see loads from 31% to 36% of the CPU capacity. And so we're seeing that the load balancing is pretty good, and that only the shards that had work to do participated. Down on the bottom, you see a lower set of percentages. Those numbers, upper graph still, 1, 2, 3%, that's the background load of having ISIS present on the node at all. Actually, I guess that's not strictly true because we don't know what the background load is without ISIS on the node, and maybe maybe that's also 2 or 3%. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if a Linux node has a certain amount of traffic no matter what you have on it. But in any case, those are the unactive nodes, but they are part of ISIS. And then down on the bottom, uh, we see what happens when we introduce failures. The first glitch, you can see we're running at a certain performance. This one is uh, 3,000 operations per second. It was a kind of a small group. Um, and we weren't doing a huge rate. We introduced a failure that killed just a couple of members. Um, I think it was a single failure in a group of 128 members. And what happens there is we take one member, remap it, remember, and fix the set of tuples, and that causes a very brief performance glitch. We see performance drops to 500 operations a second, and then it recovers. All right. Then we killed a third of the members in the DHT. And what's interesting is to see that the amount of time to handle this much bigger failure event is roughly the same. Um, of course, we've lost about a third of our processing capacity for this 128 member group. Now, you could say to yourself, 3,000 operations per second, that doesn't sound very fast. But it's important to realize that that's very much a function of what the operations were asking the system to do. 3,000 hard operations per second might be very impressive, and 3,000 no ops per second would be more of a measure of, of our overheads. This actually is closer to no ops, and you'd probably be right and say, you know, for no ops, it's pretty high overhead. And I think what it tells you is that the ISIS DHT is meant for relatively big kinds of things, 
Um, uh, however, as we continue to optimize the performance of it in 2014, uh, we may well see these numbers climb enormously. I would say it wouldn't be at all surprising to see 30 or 50,000 per second by late in 2014 with an optimization running on InfiniBand where right now we believe that these numbers were limited by um, the network performance of InfiniBand. So to summarize, ISIS2 has actually got quite a powerful DHT in it. You have to use it from C Sharp, C++ CLI, or Iron Python, which is perhaps a big limitation. Uh, however, in 2014, we're going to move over to a case where you'll be able to start using this inside Hadoop, HDFS, and MapReduce um, from uh, applications that might be coded in C++ or C, or even from the command line, and where the objects might be big files. And I think that in that time frame, we're really going to have quite a powerful way to do consistent dynamic data updates for the MapReduce user who already has a pile of MapReduce code and they don't want to change a line of it, but they do want dynamically changing underlying MapReduce data. And we're going to be able to give them that with these strong consistency properties um, at relatively high data rates as long as the objects are reasonably big. Because then these overheads that I've been showing you would be sort of off in the background amortized over the work. And we'll, by then, we'll be using InfiniBand efficiently, and we'll be doing out-of-band data transfers, which is another feature of ISIS, in order to move the big objects. So by pulling all those features together, we're going to move into a part of the big data space that no other system exists in. And um, I think quite an exciting part because of the strong consistency, fault tolerance, and security properties of the platform. So we're going to stop at that, and I hope that the module turned out to be useful for you.